Onam and praise the Lord. Welcome to this special edition of Call to Serve where we are contemplating the prophetic role and the great gift of priesthood to the church. On this special day, we are very blessed to receive in this program a great leader of the church, a grace-filled leader of the church. His Grace, Most Reverend Jacob Thumkuri, the Archbishop Emeritus of Trishur. So join us as we proceed to the Archbishop's residence and spend these moments of grace with him. Your Grace, on this beautiful day of Onam, we wanted to give a, a special gift to our audience and we thought there could be nothing more beautiful than this program where we share on your call to serve God. So welcome to the sets of Divine Vision and thank you so much for making this time for us. I am very happy to be here today with you, taking part in this program and thank you very much for the cordial welcome you accorded me. Your Grace, when we look at the journey of your life, we can very clearly see how uh, strongly led it is by the beauty of God. You come from a big family and then you give your life in priesthood and then you study, you, you're sent abroad, you, you've done your doctorate in Rome and you study in Fordham, New York and then when you come back, the Lord is constantly raising you up to lead the people. You were the Bishop of Manantavadi of Terichery and, and then you became the Archbishop of uh, Trichur and uh, all along you have been guiding the church in a very graceful and very effective manner and even over these last 12 years you're constantly receiving people and pastoring the people of God. Can you share with us how did you personally experience the voice of God guiding you and how does this uh, connection with God that you have make you continue to make you so relevant in the ministry of serving and, and building the kingdom of God. I think my life as a priest and a bishop was rather very simple. I was trying to walk in the presence of God. I would go to him for consultation. Whenever there is a problem, the first thing I do is go to him the Blessed Sacrament, consult with him and then take the necessary action as prompted by him. Actually it is he who manages everything. I am such a weak, unworthy servant, but God takes care of everything. I just remember an incident where my prophetic role had to be exercised. There was a serious situation of injustice in, in my diocese. The problem was appointment, appointment of teachers in the school. Appointment is done by the corporate manager, but it, he does according to what the local manager says. And it is our desire that there should be no corruption, no capitation, no bribe, donation, anything connected with with um, appointment of teachers. But this was happening, they, they were taking money and the, and the appointments were made mainly based on money. Of course they had to pass the examinations, the necessary certificates they had to, prov to provide. But then of course there is the question of merit. There may be a poor girl from a very poor family who has good record and maybe very high in merit. But she doesn't get a job because 
there may be a person who is ready to offer any amount of money for the appointment. As this is going on, the rich people are getting, the, getting appointments and the poor people were discarded. So I thought this is, this is very this blatant injustice. So he wanted to interfere. Then, this is not a, not a, not a small problem. It grew to a very, very big problem. I said here after corporate, the appointments will be made by the corporate management. Mm -hmm. Of course, the local manager can recommend that so. But according to strict criteria and strict norms, appointments will be, will be done solely on the basis of merit. But then this was challenged by the by some of the priests and the people who had schools in their parishes. They said, we built the school, we are the owners of the school, and we will appoint. You don't have, you don't have any right to interfere in our matters. Mm -hmm. But this was going to be, then I said, this is my decision. So then a pastor council was convened, and I explained to them the situation, how it is unjust to appoint people based only really on money. Why, how, how unjust it is to deny appointment to a person who really merited, especially because he or she hails from a very, very poor family. So this was discussed and people didn't like it. So I really thought I was like a prophet there because Prophet is stand, stand, stand for justice and he will be rejected. So then came some of the priests, spoke against me in the, in the past council. One said, I be cast away from Trichur, I, I come from outside of Trichur, so I like to face fire and brimstone. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Panambali and Mondasiri, they were great people, but they crashed on the question of education. That's what's going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I listened, listened very peacefully, but I didn't budge. I, I stood firm. People sensed that I'm, going to, I'm not going to change. And I took that decision, although with much difficulty, Finally, they had to agree to this just way of appointing. So all through this, uh, through this incident, I was feeling, I, 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 I'm not powerful enough to face these people, they are very powerful people. But I always went to the Lord, asked His protection, His guidance. And I'm quite convinced that it is, it is the Lord who who manages everything, not we poor people. I also felt, felt I should be a prophet in the, in the diocese. Regarding celebrations, regarding churches, constructions and so on, I saw that there are so many churches were being built with great extravagance, spending crores and crores of money. Then celebrations were carried on without any license. Um, lavishly spending. All these things were, put, were written in a, in a past letter and he asked them to curb their tendency to celebrate so lavishly, spend money for fireworks and other things and to channel that amount to the poorest people. That's what I did, to study the churches but what happened is that some accepted these things, but on the whole, this was not accepted, especially because as going against the culture of Trichur area, where people are... You uh, need to flaunt it, you uh, need to show what you have. <laughs> <laughs> then I, I prayed over it. I, uh, I wanted to find out why I did not succeed in this, in this, in this prophetic approach. Then I remembered, my Saint Maria Vianney, John Maria Vianney, a priest visited him, asked him why people are not coming to him as people throng 
to Maria Vianney. Then the saint asked him, do you keep vigil? He said, no. Do you fast? No, I don't. Do you sleep on the floor? No. Do you scourge, scourge yourself? No. Nothing. So many questions and he had to answer no to every question. Every question. My dear Vini asked me the same questions. <laughs> Do you fast? Do you keep vigil? Do you, do you have ascetical practices? No, the answer was no, no, no. When Vianney said, okay, no wonder. <laughs> <laughs> you are not a problem. You are not a problem in these matters. So you had to fail. So that's what happened. Then there should be, there should be a decisive attitude. You should really want to accomplish it. Then only, I remember the story of the leopard who chased a hare. Because the poor hare, with all its might, ran fast and finally entered into its hole. The leopard was the very fastest, fastest animal, but he couldn't catch, catch the hare. When he returned shamefacedly to his group, they asked him, you claim to be the fastest animal in the world, yet you couldn't, you couldn't cast that hair. Shame on you. Then he said, you know, the hair was running for his life. I was running for my lunch. Oh. That's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you are really coming, you really want something, then you would use the force. So I think in all my, in my life, in the diocese, the service, of the service of the people. I have tried to be a prophet, taking the place of Christ, of course, unworthy servant, all the same. I have tried to some extent to be a prophet and to be guided by, the, by, by God, by Jesus. Always have a recourse to Him when there is, whenever there is a problem. That's my experience. So leadership, when God raises you to that level, it's uh, not as glossy and comfortable as we see it, but in fact it's a call to be a voice in the wilderness, guiding people and uh, you really need to pray and, right. and, and the penances and uh, the interior life has to be there. Your Grace, when we look at the Christian, the sign of the Christian is the cross and Christianity is not about the prosperity gospel that we hear about but it has always been about standing up to a challenge, standing up for the cross and especially in our times now, being a Christian is a challenge. The church is going through crisis, the media and the culture is very firmly posed against the church. So at this time, what does it mean to understand our faith and to stand up for our faith? Well, it's a, it's a time of great crisis for the church. That's different because overall you see the spirit of consumerism, hedonism, people defecting from the church um, and very lax morality. It's a, it's, a, it's a very tremendous situation. And then we are forced to ask how do we face how are we going to face this tremendous situation? Especially in this age in this day and age when there are so many scandals in the church where priests, bishops, even cardinals are involved. So it's a great shock for the people and a great scandal. Then of course, what are we to say, what are we to think in this situation? 
I think we, we could go back to Jesus, Jesus himself. Jesus wanted, wanted to wanted some people to help him evangelize the world. Mm -hmm. He had to choose the team for that. And he went up to the mountain and spent the whole night in prayer, asking the Father what he should do, whom he should select, and so on. He came back after this session with the, with the, with the Father, and then he selected 12 people to be apostles. And what happened after this selection? One of them became a traitor, mm -hmm. Judas. Jesus did not select him so that he may become a traitor, but he became one. The selection was done by the very Jesus directly. And so we wonder, how is it, is it possible that if Jesus made the selection, one of them could turn a traitor? Well then, one of the 12 means more than 8% mm. <laughs> defection. We don't have that, that proportion now in the church. Perhaps those who left the church or were became traitors or defected, deserters, maybe one person or little, little more than that. So compared to the, to the time of Jesus, our time is You're not... A little no. better off, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> a little better There's off. There's a lot of hope there. <laughs> <laughs> but the main problem is that what happened in the church after this great tragedy, the church never concentrated on Judas, focused their attention on Judas. Instead, the church focused their attention on the faithful 11, 11 people. If the church focused on Judas, the church would have been finished and shattered. Here. shattered yeah. So, yeah. So the, the situation is that focusing must be on the, on the good people, on the people who really lived the doctrine of Jesus and not those who left it. What our communication media are now doing is they focus not on the eleven faithful, holy martyrs, but on the one who left. So in in our situation, they always focus on those um, on those who left the church. So their attention is on the rotten people. They feast on the carcass like a vulture. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening. So now we have to solve this problem now. What is the real solution for this for this great scandal, defection, defection that is taking place in the church? What is required of us? The, I think the real answer is the whole world, the church, expects the church to be holy. The, the face of the church is holy. Now that face is a little bit, uh, what to say? Tainted. Tainted. And they have to regain that holy face of the church. And that's a, that's a challenge for all of us, for, all, for the whole people. It's a wake-up call for the whole church. Now the times we are, we are living in is a most difficult time. It's a very challenging time. Fulton Jinji said he would like to live when the church is suffering, mm -hmm. not when the church is thriving. Because we show what we really are when we face the challenges. Anybody, any, even a dead carcass can float, can downwards, down the river. But to, to face the current and swim, it's more difficult. That's a difficult thing. Yes, that's where we witness, witness. to who we are yeah, in the time are. of crisis. Exactly, exactly, that's crisis. So the, if we have this time of crisis, we have, we can, um, we have to be counted because we want to swim against the current. So we are invited to do that. Um, and I read the story of a small boy who was, um, who was part, taking part in a mass, a holy mass. And the priest was not handling, handling the mystery, so 
and devoutly. So you said sad. The boy said, Lord, if you call me to be a priest, I will I will deal with you in a better way. Mm. <laughs> if the <laughs> if something is wrong, that boy's attitude is the best thing. I will I will see that something is done about it. I will be a good priest if I am a good priest and I will celebrate Mass properly. So in this in this situation, holiness is the most important thing. And naturally people sometimes because of these scandals, leave the church, accuse the church for about, about everything. And Francis Sales says, mm -hmm. when there is a scandal, there is a spiritual murder. I give a scandal, that's a spiritual murder. But at the same time, for those who receive the scandal, it could be a spiritual suicide. Because if, if scandals are happening in the church, I don't want to be a part of the church. I don't. Do, I don't want any more mass sacraments, word of God. I'm depriving, depriving myself. myself exactly. I am depriving myself of all these things that sustain my life. So this should, should not happen. The church will never, um, never falter. Church will remain, remain successful because we are in the bark of Peter. And the mark of Peter will never capsize. Jesus is in that. So we have this great confidence that we will go forward, never be discouraged. So this time of crisis and every challenge we face is a call for us to rise up, uh, not to be destroyed, but, but to rise up to uh, live that holiness, holiness that God, God wants of us. Grace, could you share with us what you see as the most beautiful dimension of priesthood and why would you dare to ask a young person today to step aside from the world and give his life or her life to Jesus? I'm at a loss to decide which what is the most beautiful dimension of a priesthood because for me when I look at priesthood everything is so beautiful, so glorious that I, I find it difficult to say one thing is better than the other. But at the same time, but at the same, I asked some people about this. I asked some sisters what they found most precious, most beautiful in the, in the priesthood. Then the majority of them said it is the sight of a priest celebrating the Mass with the people. That's what appeals to them most about priesthood. Of course, they are, they are always very pious, religious. Mm -hmm. Actually, they, we could expect that answer. We had the story of a, of a deacon who had cancer in Poland. Mm -hmm. And he was going to die, but the bishop decided to order him priest so that he could say Mass and die. Mm -hmm. And he was given ordination. He celebrated Mass and died. But that was something he aspired for, to just celebrate one Mass in life. That is the greatest ambition and greatest happiness that he had. Mm. So celebrating a Mass, of course, is so precious, there is no doubt. But then I asked the same question to young people, to the youth. Mm -hmm. Then they told me, we, la we like a priest who is like Christ, the humane, quality of a priest. True. A priest who smiles at them, walks with them, deals with them, ready to listen to them and ready to help them to be a friend, to be a father. The kind of Christ who, who walked on the earth, healing people, listening to them, understanding them, expressing his love for them. So they said, this is what we like most about a priest, that 
a humane quality of praise, not very strict or very, so very pious, or rigid. Not but too distant. Not too distant. <laughs> close, close to the people. In the, in the light of what the, what the youth thought, I think I would propose to the youth, why not take the place of Christ? I remember the story of a woman in Kings County Hospital. An old man was dying in an accident. And as he was going to die, the nurses told him that he, his life is going to end. If he had any desire to express, he could do that. Then he said, I would like to meet my son, where is he is in the military. So this sol soldier's son was brought to the hospital and the nurses said, there is your father dying, go and meet him. Of course he was not able to speak. but. Then they told the old man, your son has come. With all his might, he took his hand and reached it to his son's hand. And they held the hand together for, for two hours, continuously. And they told the young man, you can, you can leave the hand now, take some rest and come back. But he, he wouldn't. After about one hour more, the, the, that grip slowly Loosened. loosened, and he was dying, he died. When this old man died, this young soldier asked the nurse, who is this, who is this old man? Is he, is, he not your, is he not your father? No, he is not. Then why did you stay there about three hours holding the hand? He said, that old man really needed the presence of his son. Of his son. So, I acted as, as his son. I, I think all the, the a priest is acting in the person acting in the person of Christ and also for the people. So that's so beautiful. So the one call to be a priest would be a call to be Jesus. Exactly, exactly. To give the love of Jesus, the right. touch of Jesus to this world that so needs it. Your Grace, priesthood seems so fascinating a call to be the face of Jesus and like you mentioned earlier a necessity for prayer and suffering and suffering is the challenging aspect of priesthood all the more can you share with us your experience of suffering and how you saw the Lord working through these sufferings I'm a person to whom God is God has, God gave very little suffering. Oh. <laughs> when I was in Manandavari. I was the, I was very young at that time. I was bishop when I was forty two years old. And of course being young and dynamic, I used to do many things and I was happy about what was going on there. Then some of the priests said, after about four years I think, they said, Will the bishop be ready for an evaluation? by the priests. Oh, that is a new idea. I said, why not? You can evaluate me. So we had a priest conference. They gathered together. They were very happy that they could evaluate the bishop. <laughs> <laughs> and they split it into, into different groups. They had their um, um, questionnaire over the thing. They discussed the matter, discussed. And in the end, they had to bring the report of each group to the common meeting. And the meeting was held. I was there on the day, days and they were one after another reading the report, reports of the groups. And you know what they said? They said, I am, I am slow in decision making. I don't visit the parishes as often as they like. Uh, they said, uh, the bishop likes the sisters more than the <gasps> priest. <more than the, laughs> <laughs> more, than, more than the priest. Like that they, they, 
they made so many allegations. And it was all right, so that was their findings. But it was not, not a pleasant thing to listen to these, yeah. these remarks. I am sitting on the days and people are all, the priests are all gathered together. And what pained me most is that occasionally they clap their hands when, when something was read like that. So at the end of it, I was so, so pained. Never had I such pain in my life. I said, I have nothing more to lose. Like the Marxist worker said, I have nothing to lose except the, ch except the chains. So I reached such a condition. Being young and uh, inexperienced, I, I should never have allowed the priest to ev evaluate like that. Yes, very brutal, uh, very but, very but, uh, unchristian. Uh, no, but the priest said, you see, we evaluated only the negative points. Positive points we did not. If we had to narrate all the positive points, we would need so many things to say, so many volumes to say. So they said, we love you. We are so happy that you allowed us to evaluate you. <laughs> they showed much love after us. But that was all true. But this pain that was inflicted on me lasted about six months. Mm -hmm. I had to pray, I had to go for retreats and so on. But this was not giving. I approached an elderly priest, very good priest, then told him how I go through these pains. Then he said, the best comment for on you, that you allowed the priests to express their opinion about yourself, and they could do that without any fear of retaliation. Yeah. So that's a credit for you. And so that is the consolation I got from him. Anyway, went on like that. After service, I was healed, but that was a great blessing for me. How God changed me in a way. And because I, I was so young as a bishop and could do many things, I was building up um, a life according to, to my whims and fancies. I was reminded by the Lord that my life has to be built upon better foundations, on the glory of God and the Word of God. And from that period onwards, I started living a better life. So it was God's beautiful intervention. And besides, this, the priest who, who had eva evaluated me, they became so thick friends. <laughs> After us, they showed great love for me. And so everything turned out to be, turned out to be so good. That suffering was suffering, was God's design. Everything went on well. Mm. Suffering actually pushes us out of the superficial existence. Right, yeah, yeah. Your Grace, you give us a lot of confidence. You've shared with us that there's so much of beauty in the church, so much of beauty in priesthood, and in, even in sufferings, so much, of, so much of treasures. Could you share with us what you have in your heart as a vision for the church? Listen to one of the prayers in the Siroma about Mass. It is said, this is the prayer. Give us the good will to think with the church and cooperate with its activities. So this is the prayer. Give us the grace to think with the church to cooperate in its activities. Who is the church? Who is the one who, who prays here? The one who prays definitely is out of the church because the prayer is that give us the grace to cooperate with the church supposed to be outside, him, outside himself. I think this is a tragic vision of the church. <laughs> I would like to see the church as just the church, the people of God. 
with the Holy Father, bishops, priests, all joined together, all the laymen joined together. And so, according to me, the church is the people of God. And if it is the people of God, starting from the Pope to the last child recently baptized, they are all equal in dignity, in Christian dignity. Of course, with different roles to play, that's another thing. But in dignity, they are all the same. And the Holy Father insists on this, on this, showing that all are equal. He washes the feet of not only men, even women, prisoners. And to celebrate a feast, he would say to the, the poorest people, in Rome, sitting along with him. That's a wonderful sight. A, he gives equality for everybody. And that should be the picture, that should be the picture of the Church. In such a picture, there is no clericalism, where the priest worries about and others obey. That's not the picture. When the Holy Father sits with the, with the poorest people, he is the one who says he is there as their servant and they are the masters. So that's the kind of church we would like to, like to see. Then I would like to see the church as a family of families. All the families joined together is the church. Naturally, um, we, have, we don't have now big families. Most of these nuclear families and what happens is that there is no the liveliness, the cheer of the children rich families. There is life only when there are children in the family. So I hope in the near future there will be families with more children, with more life. The, in, the, in the nuclear families, the parents are prepared to give the children anything they ask. Whether it is needed or not is not a problem. Children ask and they, they provide. But what the children need most and desire most is not the things the parents could give, but it is maybe more company of the parents themselves and also of other children. A child would like to get the company of a little brother, of a little sister, but they don't get it. They get instead things. That is not enough. So there has to be many siblings in the family when they all live together. And in such families, the children learn to share, to suffer, to sacrifice. And they get used to saying no to themselves. And they get used to hear no from their parents, but all for their best. Yes. So you see, that in the future, church must be a family of families. That is my desire. And here at the church in, in, in uh, South India especially, I see that um, in the Catholic Church is rather triumphant and uh, showy and powerful. I wish the church were next so showy and triumphant and uh, powerful. If you travel through the streets in, 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 in Kerala, in South India, you will see magnificent churches and people grow, glorying in the fact that they constructed such a wonderful, costly church. They are very showy. They celebrate feast, very sumptuously dining, and also super flow of hot drinks. That's the way they celebrate. Moderation they don't they don't have. Then I think this kind of formalism creeping into a church. 
I celebrated Mass in a, in, a, in a parish. And naturally at the end of the Mass, the parish priest, a young priest, he was making announcements. Naturally that's, that's needed. And something struck me. Uh, as, he, as he gave the announcements, he said, no, the, cat, the, catech, the first communion children should come for the catechetical instruction. So please send them. That's what, what he wanted to say. The way he said is, Father wants you, Achan wants you, to send your children for Catholic, first communion children to Catholic, to catechetical instruction. Who is this Achan? He is somebody <laughs> outside the community. So he is something separate. Achan wants so. This is the type of kind of saying. Achan wants it. Achan says this. Achan goes there. Funny. I thought I am being an old man. <laughs> <laughs> May not be understanding properly the the new the, the new gen communications way. So I did not make any remark. But after when I came back, I read an article from by a doctor, a priest, what I could and he. He has written, there is this formalism creeping into the church and excitedly quoting, Achan wants this, Achan wants that, isn't it? He's the, the, the person who is speaking, he's, he's, he's the, the Achan, Achan. he's the Achan. Mm -hmm. But Achan wants, so he is something so sacred, so different. That's, that's kind of formalism. Uh -huh. Now I, I, I also thought about the, about the jurisdiction of our church. Now, Latin Church, Malabar Church, Malangara Church, all have jurisdiction all over the, all over India. Well, it is good. Okay, okay, all can go and evangelize, but it is good for the immigrants. But then I thought, you see, these people did the different rites go to the north, evangelizing. What kind of liturgy they will have? I understand that the Zero Malabar Church, with the diocese in the north, they impose the zero Malabar liturgy on those poor people who do not know how to read and write and who don't have any any background. But they believe that this is St. Thomas' <laughs> faith and it should be imposed you see, through the liturgy. I would I always thought, my God, why should they impose this foreign liturgy on these poor people, the poor uh, Dalit, the scheduled cars, tribes and so on. I read the articles of Bishop Elevenal. He gives the hermeneutics of liturgy in their, their, in their bulletin. Beautiful, beautiful explanations. But the people in Bombay are so highly educated. They can understand. And in spite of their knowledge, they still need the hermeneutics of liturgy, even now. If such advanced people need hermeneutic liturgy, what about those poor people, the Dalits and so on, who are in the north? How would they understand a liturgy that is, that is imposed on them from Malankara, Malabar and Latin rites? So I thought it is, I found it very funny. Go there, evangelize them, if they accept Jesus, then evolve a liturgy of their own, which must be the same for all for all the rites. Same, because the liturgy evolved from the, from these people should be acceptable to whatever right they are. So I thought in the, in the future, my my view of the church is that liturgy must be for the people. It should be adapted to their understanding to their circumstances, to their traditions, their customs, etc. The church I envisage is a church of the poor. Church and a poor church. Not only of the poor, but a poor church. Ready for sharing and not for holding things up. It must not be conformed to the world. It is in the world, but should not be conformed to the world. We should accept that the church is to be renewed eternally. 
never sit down glorifying the past. The old is gold, you know. Not enough to worship with the lips, but the heart also should be there. So you have to give attention to the prayers. Then there shouldn't be any competition and groupism within the church, which destroys the church. There's a kind of glorification of the, of the prophets, some godly persons, which also is not, not very good for the church. There should be credibility and transparency in the service and in the servants. The, these are the concepts I have about, the, about our church. I expect that we'll have a beautiful church serving, serving the people in all humility and devotion. With the heart of Jesus. With the heart of Jesus, yeah. And I'm sure the Blessed Mother is behind all these things. In my life, I have experienced the presence and help of the Blessed Mother. Whenever I had any problem, I always approached the Blessed Mother and I was granted what I needed. So I'm very, very confident about everything. As long as the Mother is with me, everything will be all right. Your Grace, we can really see that Mother Mary is with you. There's so much of grace in you and she is with the church. And it is so beautiful what you have shared, your vision of the church, that God is holding us in his heart. We are the church and, and uh, there is so much of love to be lived as the church. Thank you so much for, for being with us. And let me assure you, your grace, um, as we seek your prayers, we want to tell you, we hold you in our heart. We hold you in our prayers. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Grace. Dear friends, it has been a very blessed moment for us as a family of the church. These are moments when we are being filled with God's grace and we are learning to live out this grace. We pray that this program has been a blessing for you and we will see you next week, same time, on Call to Serve.